This conference will now be recorded. So let's start from back propagation. So can someone of you tell me what is back propagation? One of you guys. Why do we use it? To minimize the error? Yeah, we want to minimize a certain error. Uh, is it, are we obliged to use back propagation? What, uh, first, what algorithm are we using to minimize the error? Gradient descent. Perfect, yeah, we are using the gradient descent. And the gradient descent requires what? What does it require? Minima, the minima. Well, the minima is uh, where we want to go, but what do we need to compute the, the gradients? <laughs> we, we need to compute the derivatives. Global minima? No, well, uh, we hope yeah. to, go, to get to the global minima, but we need to compute the derivatives. That's what, what is required for the gradient to work, for gradient descent. Are you happy with this? Are you fine with this? No, you are not. Let's see if I have... But with the with the derivative, sorry, because maybe I missed the the last session. So, but uh, with the derivative, we can we we find like mini minimums, right? Yeah, the derivatives like the slope will direct us to the minimum, like here. Okay, so the only minimum, or because I know it's like when we don't have like. Only one minimum we have mini we can well uh, we will get to the local minimum. minimum. Oh, okay. Okay. We will get there. Let's for example here. Let's say this is our loss function. And we want to make this loss function as small as possible. So yes. this is the loss, the value of the loss. Mm -hmm. And this is just one parameter. Because we can visualize more than one parameter. So this is the loss. If we start here, we, we are going to end up here. If we start right. here, mm -hmm. we will end up here. So what do we need to do to, to, to go to, to, to decide to which direction to go to this direction or this? We need to compute what? Derivative. Exactly. The derivative is all the, what we call the gradient. It's just a vector oh. that touches this point. Okay. So it depends from uh, which point we start. De definitely. OK. It depends on what point we are going to use as uh, our starting point. Okay. We compute the so derivative. We are the one who set the, the starting point? Oh, of course, randomly, generally. Ah, OK. Uh, we, are, we have some algorithms to do that. We, we talked about them last time. I'm going to talk about them later. Just imagine like you are this guy. This guy is, by the way, blind. He can't see. And we are asking him to reach uh, the minimum or where, uh, where, is, where is the valley, the lowest point. And we put him somewhere. What, what, this, what is this guy going to do? He will use like his feet to see where the gradient is pointing. He can feel it. Correct. He can just feel it where the gradient is and he will follow the gradient. And by just following the gradient, he will, of course, when he feels there is a hill, he will not follow the hill. But when there is a downhill like this, he will try to follow it until he reaches the gate. It might take him a lot of time, but he will probably reach the minimum that is like uh, related to this uh, slope. And this is what is the, what the definition of the derivative or the, or the gradient. It just points by a straight line to where the gradient is going. OK? So we need. The main thing in the gradient descent is to compute this derivative. Um, and by the way, it's multiple derivatives because here we have like uh, one parameter. But when we have multiple parameters, we compute the gradient across all of them, theta one, theta two, etc., till theta n. We have to compute the gradient. It's like uh, if when we are, for example, in two dimensions, a vector like this is composed by two vectors. This vector. And this vector. 
This is one direction, and this is another direction. And this is the entire gradient direction. So we need to compute the derivative. And that's it, basically. Once we know the derivative, we are done. We just uh, move a little bit towards the direction. We can jump, but it can be dangerous. For example, if, the, if we are near the minimum and we jump, we, we know it is this direction, we jump into this direction, we can end up here. So we just need to know the direction and move a little bit towards this direction. Okay? It's very simple, don't you think? So, yeah, we need to know the starting point and the direction. This two. The direct, yeah, the direction is the gradient. Okay. Which is computed by the derivative. Just we derivate and we get the gradient. And the starting point, we generally choose it randomly. We have some strategies that we are going to talk about, but mm -hmm. that's what, what we use. Okay. So, then why do we use backpropagation? So this is the gradient. So if you can see here, this is the parameters. So we update the parameter, theta. This is simply the derivative, the gradient. And it is multiplied by a small number. So we, uh, we don't have to jump. We just fix it. So this is the gradient. And we keep doing it until we reach the minimum, until the gradient is, becomes what? When we reach the minimum, what happens to the gradient? To the gradient? Zero equals zero. zero. Yeah, yeah. Flat zero. thing. Flat thing. Sorry. When we are here, the gradient is flat, which means zero. Okay. So this is my well, where we want to go. Generally, it doesn't really become zero, but it becomes very small. Zero point zero zero zero. Something like that. So this is for the how the gradient descent works. Now with back propagation, let's start with a very simple explanation. Forget about gradient descent for now. Let's start with a simple explanation for back propagation. Once we have a, when, we, when we have a neural network like this one or this one. We fire, which means we do a forward pass. We fire the data and we get some results here. Okay? We get some results. Then what we do, we do, we take these results and we compute the error. The error is the difference between what should have been minus more or less what we computed, what we got here. This is the error that we made. For example, if it was class one and we computed here class zero, it means that the error is zero minus one. This is a very simple, simple way to compute errors. We have, we have like last time we talked about uh, cross entropy, but this is basically what we are doing. We observe the difference between the input and the output. And we do it for the whole batch, for all the, like the data set that we are going to use. Okay, guys. And once we compute this error, it's a value. We are going to update this parameters based on how much they contributed to this error. For example, if we have the error here of, we got an error here of three. We start dividing it. Here we got an error like uh, equal three. We start dividing it. You contributed by say twenty percent. You by ten percent. You by etc. And we divide this error based on how much they contributed. And we ask each neuron to update its weights based by how much it contributed to the error. So of course the one that contributed most to the error would receive more update. The one that is responsible more will receive a higher penalty. For example, if this one is 20%, this one 10, 10, 10, etc. For example, 
this the wheels of this neuron will probably receive more a higher penalty and more updates. That's that's all. Uh, do you agree with this? I said forget about gradient descent. We are just talking about common sense here. Are you happy with the, so far with what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, everybody. No. For me, no. <laughs> yeah, the, the guys just tell me no. There is no problem. There is no problem with a no. <laughs> so. As I said, forget about gradient descent. You want just to update my network based on uh, the error. So, so here we are calculating um, uh, the error, right? Yes, we uh, we compute okay. when well, we fire the network, put the, the, the data set here, get some results, uh -huh. and then we see if it is if it is, if it is matching the data set or not. But if the data set, for example, said it's five, it should be five. And here we got like three. So this is the error. This is some uh, like an absolute error. The error is the difference between what we had in the data set. The data set is the real, are the real values we have. For example, this is a data set. This is my class. And these are my. It's features. like the predicted value minus the, the value. Yeah, exactly. It's the predicted value, the difference between the predicted value and uh, the real value. Yes. This is the error that we made. Mm -hmm. So once we get this error, we start di distributing this error. For example, if the error is three, well, we don't do it only for one uh, row. We do it for all the, the most, a lot of rows. And we see what's the total error. We take this error and we start distributing it. We say you are responsible for like 20% of the error. You are responsible for 10%. We see how much they are responsible. Based on what? Based on the weight. Here, this output in a neural network is multiplied by some weight here, by some W. Yes or no? This output. This final output is the sum of Ws multiplied by Xs. The Ws are the weights here. And the Xs are the input. Are the input here. These are the axes. Same here. This is x1. We can call it x1, x2, or we can call it just uh, a, like here. So we multiply the input by the weights. This is the definition of a neural network. The weights are this. The sorry, the, the inputs to this neuron are this. And the, each neuron has a number of weights. The number of weights is the same as the number of inputs. Each input or output from here is multiplied by a weight, W1, W2, W3, etc. And we do the sum. And we have, of course, uh, the activation function. So this is what, what we are doing here, the operation. Mariam, are you happy with this? Yeah, so far, yes. Uh, so I didn't are... understand how. Uh... Uh -huh. Go ahead, yeah, Maria. Yeah, how we distribute the error. It's like uh, distribution yes. is kind of confusing. The word is kind of confusing. How uh, we, distribute we distribute it. the error. Part of, for example, if if the, the, this weight is very high, it means that this has contributed a lot to the error. Yes or no? Because this is multiplied by a high weight, so this is this has contributed a lot to the error. So which means this has is more responsible to the to the error than this neuron. So it's, it's like it's high. relative. Exactly, it's relative. Mm. It's by how much because we are multiplying w by, by x, the more the w is high, the more the error, the more it is contributed. This x is the more it is contributed. So we distribute, we divide it's like a chocolate, and you divide it by the one who produced who make made most work. Or a cake, and you give uh, the one that did most work uh, the, the biggest slice. But this is a, a negative one, not not really a cake. And of course, we are going to modify its weight 
it has all the Ws, its weights, based on the size the slice of the error. 20% of three, we multiply them, we get an error, and we, we, we modify the weights based on how many errors we had. This is like the slice of the error. And we do the same thing again. Are you happy, Miriam, with this? Uh, can you do like an equation, for example, for 20? We have the weight of 20 for the first uh, neural, okay? Yeah, so we have the how, weight. How we it's like the loss function uh, will be distributed on 20. Yeah, 20%. Uh-huh. This is 20% because uh, because of its weight. Okay, it's yes. Added, because it has a higher weight than this, the uh, bubble. Mm -hmm. So we take 20% of these three. Ah, okay. And we give it to this, to this neuron. And we ask it to update its weights by this amount, 20% of three. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. So 20% of three is just uh, 0.6. Mm -hmm. And we ask to modify itself by this amount. And same for all of them. So we modify them by the percentage, by how much they contribute to the error. Okay. Mm -hmm. Guys, are you happy with this? It's a very simple explanation here. Yeah. Not, it's not the real thing. It's just to say how much things are uh, contributing. Are you happy, guys? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. So this is how mainly backpropagation is working. But it's not the real story. Just in a nutshell. So we take the error, we distribute it, how much each one is contributing, same with here. We take the error that is in here and we distribute it across everybody. And we, uh, we start updating all the weights. And we fire again the data set and we see the error, how it is uh, working. Normally here, the error will, will, will probably go to be reduced, to have less error. And we do the same thing again. So each time we see how uh, the error has uh, diminished and we update the, my weights or our weights until we get the minimum error or the error doesn't diminish anymore so this is back propagation in a nutshell uh is are you happy so far we can move forward yes yeah great now let's look at the mathematical explanation for back propagation Now let's go back to the derivatives and the gradients. Backpropagation is just another way to compute the gradients, a more optimized. Let's see how many ways we have to compute the gradients. We have what we call the numerical gradient. It's a very simple way of computing the gradient. So when, when we want to compute the numerical gradient in the numeric way, we go to this point, we choose a point close to it, for example, this one, and we draw a line. The angle is its numerical gradient, this angle. So it, we draw the line and we divide this, this value, which is this, this value fx fx plus h minus fx, and we divide it by the difference between them. So this length, we divide this length by this length. And we get the tangent of this angle. Okay? This is called the numerical gradient. It gives us some sort of slope, this uh, the slope of this line. But what's, what's the problem with this gradient, with this uh, numerical gradient? What's the problem with it? It's not precise. Yeah, it's not precise. That's true. So it generates errors. Yeah, and when the, the gradient is very small, we lose some values. We lose precision. We can see it. Well, it's not, not uh, like when we, for example, when we are here, for example, for 0.56, etc. And we move a little bit, we get something similar, but here, for example, we had a one, and here we have a we had a zero. It will be the same, so it doesn't detect more chance. 
but it, it is very general. We can compute it for any function very easily. Okay? We can compute it for any function very easily. You don't need the derivatives or any thing. But it lacks precision. And we have the mathematical gradient. The mathematical gradient, like we said last time, is the derivative that you compute mathematically. You, you, you used to do it in high school, like with a pen and paper. This is the loss function. The loss function is just, you can see, just some uh, additions, multiplication, logarithms. Here we have also the multiplications, additions. Same goes in here. This is the output of the network. H, uh, the H's are the output of the networks. So it's just the, um, and it's basically multiplication additions. We we'll multiply the weight by the output, and we have the sigmoids. So it's like just a, a very long function, actually. The loss function is just a very long, a big function, a long function. Do you agree with me? Yes. And a simple one. Logarith logarithms, exponentials, uh, multiplications, additions, that's all what it contains. So we can always, when we want to compute the derivative, we can do it by a pen and paper like we used to do in high school. It's fine to do it. But because it's so long, it can take you a lot to compute to do the derivative. Yes or no? Yes. It will take you a lot of time because this is just a compressed version, by the way. By the, way. the real one depends on the size of the network. And it can take a whole page or more, more, much, many more pages actually. And to to do it by pen and paper, it can take you several pages, some sometimes uh, thousands and thousands of pages to do it. That's why we simply use the the back propagation. Back propagation is just a simpler rule way or rule that we can apply to compute the derivative. That's why that's all about it. We are not obliged to, to use it by the way, but it speeds up it speeds up things by a lot. Okay, so it guys? works for uh, all the cases. Uh, back propagation? What yeah. do you mean by for, for all the cases? It's like when we want to compute uh, the gradient descent uh, for all the for example for different data set, it works for all the data for uh, the data set. Is the best way. Well, yeah, it works uh, of course for the data set, but you need your function, your loss function, to be derivable. Mm. You, you okay. cannot, yeah, you cannot do it without uh, derivation. You can <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, and we can, you can uh, avoid it. You can use a regular way, pen and paper way, and you get, put your deriv derivatives and compute your gradients. But back propagation is just a faster way. Why is it a faster way? Because there is a famous rule, if you remember it from high school. The derivative of combination of functions, f of g of x, is just the derivative of f. It's just the derivative of f multiplied by the derivative of what is inside f. Is the derivative of this multiplied by the derivative of this? So by doing things this way, it becomes very easy to compute our derivatives. Here is an example. We have this function, fx equal this. If we put g equals to gx equals to what? 3x squared plus 5x. Minus two. Um, I've done it here. If we put gx equal this, then and we let's call gx y. Let's call it y. F becomes eight, or uh, sorry, let's put it that way. F of y equals what? Y power to eight, and y equals this. So we are writing it this way. So we can do just the derivative of g, of, uh, sorry, this, taken by g, which means taking y as the, our variable, 
and we multiply it by the derivative of, the, of this, which gives us the derivative of this is what? Of f of y with respect to y. It's not just this. A comes here, and we reduce the, the, the power, the exponent. And the derivative of this is what? Very simple. Two goes here. X plus yeah, and it is it is this one. The derivative of this is this one. And the derivative of this is this one. Oh, sorry, of uh, this one is this one. Because we replaced y by its value. So we computed the derivative very quickly. You can see in just a few steps. And here is our de uh, derivative of f. In just a few steps, we computed it a bit. You can see it. Yeah. Very few steps. Instead, otherwise, we would have to uh, do a lot of work, like uh, taking 8 inside here, doing all of the multiplication, and it's an insane amount of work. But doing things this way, and we don't need to do uh, and to, to make this 7 inside, because we can compute any value, just replace the x, and we get uh, my gradient. So it's just a fast. This is called the chain rule derivative. When we have a, co a combined, like combined functions like this one, it makes things very easy. The derivative is computed in a fast way. So back to the equation again. Let's say we have this this graph. We call this graph a uh, computational graph. It, does, it just means we have x plus y here. We multiply it by z. So the, what we are trying to compute is x plus y multiplied by z. So because it's like a computational graph, we can, the good side of the computational graph is like uh, it can be seen as a combination of functions like this one. Exactly like this one. It can be seen like a combination of functions. Like this. This is the goal of graphs, computational graphs. So this is just, this can be seen as just one function, my g. And this is my f. So g of x, y, it's just a number of variables, doesn't matter what we have here, equals x plus y. And f of g x y equals g here and z because we have this parameter to, to f and this one the inputs are just the parameters equals what g sorry what multiplied by you. yeah multiplied by z so we have a combination of functions here, which means we can apply the chain rule. Computational graphs are just some sort of, com of uh, combined functions, just in a better, in a more visual uh, way. Because we have this, can we apply this form of deriv derivative? Yes. Can we use this rule? Mm -hmm. We can, of course, we can use it. So the derivative of f with respect to x, y, and z, what it is, we just use the chain rule, which is here. The derivative of g, which is what? X plus y. Derivative of g with respect to x equals y. And the derivative of g with respect to y equals x. This is just for the g. But what we need also, the derivative of f that comes from here with respect to this. The derivative of f with respect to g is what? This is g multiplied by z. Sorry for my writing. This is g multiplied by z. The derivative of f with respect to g. 
variable. It's like G is the variable. Equals to what? Z. Z, because it becomes one. It is Z. So the derivative of X with respect, oh, sorry, the derivative of F with respect to X is what? No, it's of F, not. Uh, this is the derivative of F with respect to G. The chain rule, it says that we multiply, multiply them. This is the derivative of G with respect to X. And this is the derivative of G with respect to Y. So what we did, we do, we just multiply. So the derivative of this, of uh, F with respect to X, is this derivative, the derivative of this part by the derivative of this part, which is y, z. And this is x, z. Yeah. This is minus 2 multiplied by minus 4, which is minus 8. Same goes here. The derivative of uh, this one is very simple. We deri will deri derivate f with respect to z, which equals g. And it is the multiplication. x by y is minus 10. Guys, the main thing that we did here is that the derivative, this z, has been used twice or just once to compute the derivative uh, of f with respect to x and y. This z has been used here and here. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. So this z, this is a huge saving. Instead of if we did if we did the pen and paper derivative, we would have to like uh, try to do the derivative with respect to x and forget everything, and do the derivative with respect to y of all of this and forget everything. But here we took advantage of an intermediate derivative, which is this for this set. We took advantage of it, and we just multiply it by the local derivative of, G, of this one. So this way, we will take advantage of a lot of like uh, intermediate derivatives. This is here we have just one node for G, but in a neural network we have a lot, as you have you could you could you could see, we have a lot in a neural network. And this this is just the key for backpropagation. It allows us to do dynamic programming. We do the derivative for this for this G. Actually, it's the derivative of f with respect to g, according to the derivative for this, for the g. We compute it, and just to compute the derivative of f with respect to the first variables, we just need to multiply them. This part of the derivative multiplied by this part of the derivative, and we get my derivative. So here, we don't compute it twice. If we don't, didn't do the chain rule, we would have to do this computation by hand twice. But here, it's only once. So could you see the benefit, guys? It's just fast derivatives computation. Yes. A single yes? Or do, we have, do, we, do we have more yeses? Yes. Any more yeses or, uh, or a silence means no? Yes. Yes, Great. yes. Perfect. Please tell me, guys, if it is not good enough. I can uh, re-explain. So this is the goal for backpropagation. It just allows us to compute in a fast way the gradients. That's all what it is uh, about. When you look at the different tutorials on the internet, yes, even for myself, it's very confusing. It, gives, it doesn't tell you that it is just fast way or so. It says that it is uh, the main thing to do the gradient descent. It is actually not. It's just an optimization. Okay. And we call this dynamic programming. It's like we, uh, we compute something intermediate and we use it many times. We re reuse it. Here you can see that the graph, this graph is very simple, but something like this. It has a lot of intermediate values. And the, depth, the, the deeper it is, the more intermediate values we have, intermediate derivatives, like in here. And it can, can save us a lot of time to compute the derivatives for uh, these weights. Okay, guys? 
Yes. Okay. Something that uh, we talked about last time, but let's talk about it again. So what if the weights that we are using, for example, here, are very small, if the, these values are very small? Here, the, the derivative of this, of uh, f with respect to g, which is this one, was equal to z. If z was very small, And X was also, or Y was very small. Is that a bit smaller? The derivative of this is, no. uh, is uh, Z multiplied by X. By Y, sorry. So if they were very small, what would happen? Tend to be zero? Yeah, it becomes zero. Let's go to the real neural network, this one. If we have like a lot of layers, so we are multiplying the derivative to, to this point, g, g1, let's call it, then g2, and we are multiplying them because we are just doing the chain rule multiple times, not just uh, twice, like we were in this past ex small example. When we have a lot of layers, we use the chain rules multiple times, f of g of h of uh, whatever. We have like a lot of combination of functions. So we keep multiplying to reach. So the first layers, they will receive a zero gradient. Why? Because also the numbers in a in a machine, the numbers in a machine are very small. Sorry, when they become very small, we have a limit. For example, 32 bits float. This is how a number is. And in a machine, any number is limited. We can we can't represent infinity. 0. 0.000 .000, infinity to one. We can't represent something like that in a machine. We have always limits. Yeah. So at some point, when we reach the limit, it becomes zero. And which means that the top layers, the first layers, will not receive any gradient and will not change. Flat. So this was. Mm -hmm. It's become like it's flat, or it's not. It is what? Sorry? And the minima. It will become zero, so it will become flat. So we don't have a gradient. So no, no, it's not. Uh, it's not becoming flat. It's not flat at all. It's be just because of the lack of precision. Because the gradient is not uh, reaching, like we don't have uh, enough mem like memory to store all of this. Uh, it's so small number that we can never store it, and we lose it. This is this happens if the weights are very small, or the starting points where we start are uh, very small values. OK? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we call this problem. How did you call it? Did we call it last time? Vanishing um, gradient. Exactly. It's vanishing gradient. We have the opposite effect as well, the exploding gradient. The exploding gradient is the opposite. It's when we, you initialize your weights to high values. And of course, the derivative you are keep multiplying with the chain rule. And if you, you, you initialize that, for example, with a value of 1,000 each, you are multiplying these values. If it is like 1,000 times or more, it just becomes 1,000 to the power of 1,000, which is just insane to represent. And if we, uh, we have this exploding gradient, it will just get some random numbers at the end. We don't have, we don't receive uh, the real gradient. We just, because we can't store the big values, we just keep the smaller ones. And here we can have anything when we multiply them. So this is the exploding gradient, which is the opposite of the vanishing gradient. So a solution for it, you can normalize your input data. can normalize your input data so your data will not be too big or too small. If you remember, like normalization, we uh, made the data all between 0 and 1, something like that. There are multiple ways of norm normalizing your data. You can uh, rescale them to 0, 1. You can just use 
your values minus the standard deviation, standard by minus sorry the mean, divided by the standard deviation to normalize the data. You can refer to the chapter that we did in the first part if you want about data normalization. It's just to make the values reasonable enough in, ter in terms of magnitude. And also you can have a good strategy for weights initialization. You can use a good strategy for weights initialization. So a question, guys. Can we use Can we initialize all the weights to zero or some uh, static number? What do you think? No. Why not? Because then they will share the blame equally and they will be updated similarly. Great, great. Yeah, you still remember. I'm really happy with this. Yeah, what will happen is that they will share the blame equally. They will receive the same, exactly the same gradient. If the or, or the weights are the same, especially if the values here are uh, don't change, and they might like uh, each neuron will learn exactly the same thing, which is not good for us. So generally, a good strategy. There are several strategies, even the research area. So what we can do is initialize the weights randomly with small values between an, an, an interval, a small interval. Say, for example, O1 minus O1. We can have something like that. And uh, you get small values in this interval, not too small with this uh, random generator. We don't want like values of 0.0001, not too small, but not too big. This is a, like an interval of 0.5 over to minus 0.5. We can also, there are other ways like calibrating the variance, batch normalization. I prefer to use these methods when we get to, to the next uh, chapter, which is computer vision and CNNs. I prefer to use it uh, there. So this is, this are just some activation functions. We talked about the sigmoid, the hyperbolic uh, tangent, Rulu, I prefer also to uh, see them in the next uh, chapter because it's going to be more practical and I will shift this, some of these theories there, just not to make things too complex. Any question, guys? So far, are you happy with the uh, back propagation? So, so the solution for um... The vanishing or exploding gradient is uh, like normalization or okay, initializing. Great question. Yeah, um, great question. It's uh, mainly what we we want is something that uh, we don't multiply with small values or big values. The, so we don't really have a perfect solution yet for the vanishing gradient or the exploding gradients. There are multiple ways that can solve this help solving this problem. For example, the initialization, normalization and initialization of the weight helps a lot. Also, uh, this, so the sigmoid is not a great function when it comes to uh, vanishing gradients because of the, all of the values can be very small here in this range. And activation functions, we have them across all layers. So the sigmoid can be a bit of problem. That's why sometimes when we have deep networks we will have like uh, we prefer to use the rulu the rulu uh, activation function because most of the values are not very small as you can see here i like this here you can we can have a lot of uh, well actually when we draw it the loss function when combined with, with sigma it can be something like that so here it is almost zero here it's almost zero, and here we have good values. So here we are, we are close to zero when we are uh, here in the loss or something of the opposite. So that's why we use the rulu here. The, the key is to not to multiply, to avoid multiplying 
when we use a chain rule, very small values. So these are like a few tricks. Uh, weight initialization, uh, normalizing the data, these kind of things. Using, if the network is too deep, use the RULU instead of the sigmoid. We have other ways of dealing with it, like the residual connections. We can talk about them uh, on the next session. Is it fine? Thank you. Thank you. No problem. So now, now let's see some variants of the gradient descent. Some of these uh, variants. So for the gradient descent, we are, of course, optimizing the loss function which is just uh, to follow the slope. Imagine you are blind and ask you, we ask you to, for, to find uh, the valley or the bottom of the area, the lowest uh, in altitude. And uh, what you are going to do is just to follow where uh, the, the, the gradient is steepest using your feet to compute. It's like we, we compute the gradient with your feet to see how, to what, how they are, uh, where, to, to where they are pointing. And we you keep following them if there is like a, a hill, you don't follow the hill. When it is a downhill, you keep following it. So even if you are blind, you can still find the, the valley. Do you agree with me, guys? Yes. Yeah. OK. We instead of the gradient descent, the regular one, we use what we call the stochastic gradient descent. The, re the usual gradient descent, it takes the whole data set. It takes the whole data set. All the data. This is my y, this is my, my axis. And we use it all to compute the loss function. But Generally, when we use, we are when we are using some deep learning, we are using some GPUs, and the amount of memory is limited. We cannot use uh, the whole data set at once. So what we do, we divide it into batches. We call this the batch gradient descent. We take uh, some of the of the rows, and we compute the gradient for them. We update the gradient, and on the next iteration, we do the same thing. We take some rows and we compute the, gra the gradient again, and we keep doing that. In the stochastic gradient descent, we just take them randomly. We, ta we take the data set, say, we, we want uh, batches of size 32, and we, we sample 32 uh, rows randomly. And we compute the gradient only on them, and uh, we get uh, my values of the gradient, OK? Can you see what, what we are doing? So, guys, why we prefer this to, to use this form? Why do we, do we use mini batches? I just said it. Sorry, what? Because of limit of uh, memory. Yes, that's the first thing. The limit of the memory. We sub-sample 32, 64, depending on uh, the size of your GPU and you compute uh, the gradient only for this. Of course, we are not going to get exactly the same gradient as if we use the whole thing, because my function is now smaller. The loss function is going to be smaller. It's taking only this few, like 32 values instead of uh, 1 million. So the gradient will be slightly different. So it will, it will not be exactly the same, because it's computed only on some rows. OK? So this is the, about the stochastic gradient descent. And the, when we use the SGD, the stochastic gradient descent, and let's say this is the shape of my loss function. How many par parameters do we have here in this, in this loss function? How many parameters are we trying to optimize? Three. Now it's just two because one of them is uh, the, the value of the loss. This one 
is the value of the loss. And this is theta one and theta two. This is the value of the loss function. We want to minimize this. For example, here. We want to minimize it. Okay, guys? Okay. And this problem, as you can see here, is called a saddle point. Why is this a problem? Do you remember? If we start in this in here or so, what is the problem with this point in here? We can start. Sorry, what? We can stuck on. Uh... We can get stuck. Yeah, we can get stuck there. And why? Because why is that? Will... Because its gradient is zero. You can see the surface is flat below it. Its gradient will be zero. But it is not a minimum. It's not even a local minimum. There is just a point next to it that is better. This point is better than this one. Yeah. And it is just next to it. We call this what? Do you remember? Saddle point. We call this a saddle point. And it is where, well, we can find it by the second derivative. But that's another story. Uh, second derivative is not ideal to compute. It takes a lot of time to compute the second derivative in complex problems. So what what shall we do to avoid the getting stuck here? We have two minimum that are good, this one and this one. We want at least to find one of these. So what shall we do to avoid this? What shall, what shall you do? We should escape the sudden point. How, how can we escape it? Uh, you said before, it's like, uh, we are the one who set the starting point, right? Yeah, but we don't know where we are. We are um, Remember, we are blind. We don't see our uh, entourage. We oh, just okay. see where we are. Moving a bit, and then copy again. You can see, guys, that it is very unstable. Things next to it. If we move, Kirya, as you said, just a little bit somewhere here, we can quickly escape it because saddle points are highly unstable. You can see that. Yeah. Just if we move just a little bit here or here, we can escape. Yeah. It. Just if it's just you give it some vibrations. If you give like uh, the thing that like is in here some vibration, it can fall. It can get stuck. And these are some variants of the guided descent algorithm that can allow us to escape. There are other mathematical ways that are uh, precise, like computing the second derivative. But the second derivative is so difficult to compute. We call it, if you remember, the Hessian matrix. It, it takes a lot of time to compute because we, when we have, for example, 1,000 parameters to optimize, the Hessian matrix is 1,000 power 2, which is 1 million. And it is a lot of things to compute, so we avoid it. What we use instead, we can use just some noise. We don't use the real, the right gradient. We add some noise to it, and we can escape. With just some noise, we are descending. With some noise, we, we might go here that way, and then that way. Because it's highly unstable. OK, guys? Are you happy? How to add is like noise. What? It's yeah, it's one one way. For uh, not just that, stochastic gradient descent is not the perfect gradient because uh, it's not the perfect perfect gradient because it doesn't take all the data points. So its gradient is slightly different than the the, the real one. It will not be exactly that that direction, but it will be slightly this way or this way. So it helps a little bit. But when we add noise, the gradient, instead of pointing also into this direction, we, for example, point towards this direction or this direction. So if we add slightly some noise, we can escape this point. 
we can uh, like, because we the gradient will not point towards this direction, we we'll point to something different. And as we said, standard points are highly unstable. Just a little bit, we move a little bit away from them, uh, and we uh, we escape them. Okay. Okay, guys. Any questions so far, please? Amal, Yusuf, Miriam, you are always active. We are here. So, um, if we summarize everything, you said it's like it takes the whole data set, okay? That, the graded descent takes the whole data set, the regular one. Yeah. The regular one. And after it's separated by uh, batches. The stochastic one, yeah, takes uh, with batches. randomly batches. Okay, so is the batches the same thing that cross validation that we did uh, the last time? No, 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 not that. No, it's not for cross validation. But it has to check if our uh, model is doing well or not, is generalizing oh, okay. well. But okay. for the stochastic ones, mm -hmm. it's just first because we don't have enough memory to compute uh, the gradient for all oh, the data. Okay. And the second one is that it uh, it allows some noise because it's not the, the, it's gradient when we compute it with just 32 or 64 uh, mm -hmm. rows will be slightly different than the, the gradient of the whole batch of the whole data set sorry okay so it sorry. will be slightly different and because of this slight difference it can help to escape other points but we okay. have to add some noise as well got it i see the difference now guys can you see everything are you happy shall i move forward okay yes um Reda. Uh -huh. so yeah. with saddle point so we have like the problem um with it that the gradient is zero and the slope is flat but it's, it's just easy to fix it if we can say that because it's unstable and yeah, you can because just it's unstable evolve. yeah the strategy to escape it is to use the, the stochastic gradient descent because it's not the perfect gradient it's different and we add mm -hmm. some noise, so we don't go to, towards this direction. We don't. When we add some noise, we go slightly different, in slightly different direction. For example, this direction, not this, or this direction. But just adding this small difference, it can help us to escape it. Once we escape it, we go to the real minimum. Nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, what do you mean by noise? Noise, uh, you just, for example, you have this gradient, your gradient, V, and you add to it small values, this vector. So let, if we are in two dimensions, let's say V is 3, 2. Noise, you add to it, it becomes 3.1, 2.1, for example. This is the noise, small value to it. So instead of pointing to 3, 2 direction, this is the 3 2 gradient. It will be slightly different, like this. It will be the slightly different. This is the 3 2, and this is the 3.1 2.1. So, this is the noise. Reza? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Is it fine for the noise? Yeah, thank you, Cheers. Appreciate it. No problem. Najwa, you wanted to ask something? Or oh, we lost you. Uh, yeah, so these are some theories, guys, that can help you. So, neural network and Yeah, I think my people. network. You had a. You, you, you wanted to ask something, Najwa? Hello. Uh, hello, yeah, I can Reza? hear you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can hear you. So let's continue and come back to your question later. So why, guys? Yeah, just for the noise. Like from the visualization, we know that uh, the point is uh, close. Is what? You can hear me right now. I, I can hear you. Yeah. The, what is what? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes.
Najwa, please, we, we can uh, readdress your question later once your network is fixed. So an MLP with a single hidden layer has only saddle points and no local minima. This is a very strong assertion, don't you think, guys? Focus on it. I want you to focus on this. Uh, it's a bit old. An MLP is just a multi-layer perception. A multi-layer perception with just one single hidden layer. One single hidden layer, it means these are the input. We have a hidden layer here and the output layers. Just one. Like the one that we saw before. It has just one layer hidden and then the output layer. Plus the input layers. So it says an MLP with a single hidden layer has only saddle points and no local minimum. What does it mean for you? The saddle point is the local minimum. No, it has only saddle points and they have no local minimum. A real local minimum here. There is no local minimum and only saddle points. What does it mean? All flat. What? So there is no local minima, so it's on all the same level. I mean, there is no. It means there is a, at least. A, it doesn't say there is no global minima, minimum. It, it means there is one global minimum, no local minimum, and only saddle points. It means, guys, that my pro, my problem or my loss function is almost convex. Not convex in terms of mathematical definition, but convex in terms of uh, optimization one global minimum and all the rest are saddle points well i can't draw saddle points in two details so they don't they don't occur on two dimensions but in three dimensions the plus they occur it means that the, my problem is almost convex in terms of optimization and this is great guys because neural networks are non-convex prob problems well this is uh, it doesn't mean they are true it's just a research where they did probably things uh, in an empirical way. Another researchers or some, some researchers, they said an exponential number of saddle points in large networks. It means in large networks, we have a lot, a lot of saddle points. And very little, the research actually, we are not sure about it, by the way, guys, it's very difficult. But it seems that in real life problems where we need very large neural network with thousands or millions of weights, it seems that most minima, minimum or minima are saddle points and most global minima, uh, local minima, the local ones are very close to the global minimum. For example, like this. Here is uh, local, local, local. This is the global, local, local. They are all close to each other in this graph. They are all very close to each other. So the difference between them is not too, too bad. If we get this solution, it's not, it's not so, so bad. It seems that, re that real life is like that. Real life problems, we have a lot of local minima, a lot of saddle points, but all local minima are good. They are not bad. Not, for example, in this problem, the local minimum here is very bad because it's so far from the global one. But it doesn't happen like that in real life, in complex problems when we need very large neural networks. In very large neural networks, this thing happened, this phenomenon happened, which is really great. This is believed to be one of the secrets why deep learning works, why it works. It's really fascinating, don't you, don't you think, guys? It's yeah. like in real life problems, things become that way. But in simple problems, we get easily these kind of cases. When you hear you have a lot of parameters, you find, like in uh, image processing or text or anything, we can easily find this kind of ways. But when we deal with simple problems, we end up with this. 
What does it mean for you guys? Shall you use deep learning for simple problems or not? For me, that means like the, uh, the minimum point uh, is the good one. No, we you can use it. Yeah, it's not advisable to use deep learning for like this small for simple problems because of this uh, because the local minima minima or one one local minimum they are not good. But if they are very close to the global one, they are all almost equivalent. As you can see, and this is one of the secrets why gradient descent works in this kind of problems. This is one of the secrets why it works, and this is really great. This is uh, it's almost we were super lucky, almost too, too good to be true. That's uh, real life problems are like that, and we can optimize them by finding the ways that works well without uh, worrying about uh, global and local media. Did you understand this point, guys? Did you get it? Um, so rather, so for large networks, if you have many small local min, if you have many local minimums and not one large global minima, it's better. Yeah, we we will always have one better than the others, of course, which is the the local the global minimum. You will always have one that is uh, ahead of the others, but the, it, it's always they are always close to each other. So it doesn't matter where we start. If we start here, we end up here. If we start here, we end up here. If we start here, we end up here. But we will end up in something somewhere good, good enough. So in large so networks and complex problems, we always end up somewhere where it is a decent solution. So are you saying that for deep learning, just having local minima is better than a global minima? No, we, we prefer to have one global minima. Minima, It's better. But it doesn't seem to be an issue in deep learning. The problem is not convex, as you can see here. We have multiple ones, but they are not too bad. It's like any solution is good enough. And all other minimums that are bad, are actually saddle points. You can like just escape them by some uh, noise or some tricks. Okay. Okay. Thank are you. you. Are you sure? Are you happy, Sabir? Yeah, I am happy. Yeah, it, it just makes um, because we know we have been talking about global minima throughout the course. Mm -hmm. So in deep learning, it's just we now have more um, local minima, and that's good enough in real life situations. Yeah, it's a, it's a special case. Really, a special case. In what we did before, we always wanted convex problems with, with one global minimum. We always wanted that. But the, in deep learning, we couldn't afford that. But instead, we had a lot of minima, minima that are not bad enough or, or not bad too bad. They, they are all good enough. And all the bad minima, minima are saddle points, which can be escaped. This is why, even though the problem in deep learning is not convex, but we still get decent solutions and the, uh, the good performance. We will uh, study this uh, aspect uh, the more we advance in the other topics, guys, because it's always good to understand what is happening behind uh, the scene. OK, guys, are you happy with this? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Uh, do you want to pause, guys? I think uh, I took a lot of your energy. Be great, yeah. Yeah, okay, let's get a uh, pause uh, 10, or let's go for 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, no problem. This conference will now be recorded. These are some examples of uh, the STD, such so, as so the descent. We have here saddle points. You can see the SGD has a problem to uh, escape. It's staying there. Others, momentum, mag, are escaping easily. Not easily, I think. Uh, they are uh, staying there a little bit and then escaping. But uh, other grad, other delta, RMS prop, you can see they quickly uh, escape. 
the, the saddle points. You can see quickly they move here and uh, they go away. So now let's have a look. We will go, go back to gradient descent and these algorithms, but let's have a look at the regularization. So imagine you have trained the neural network to solve some problem. You split your training data to 80%, 20%, 80% for training, 20% for testing. You, of course, normalize, scale your features, etc. You use a very large neural network and you get a training accuracy over of over 99%. And testing accuracy that is less than 10%. This is a huge problem, don't you think? Guys, this is a huge problem. You got a training accuracy over 99% and a testing accuracy that is less than 10%. We surely overfitted. The neural network, because we are using a very large one, it probably has overfitted. It just learned how to classify the terrain samples, but it can't generalize. Is that, is that, is that what happened? Yeah. Yes, this is what happened. Yeah. So why do you think it overfitted? Why do you think it overfitted? A large network has a lot of weights. When we have a lot of nodes or neurons, we have a lot of weights. It is possible, guys, that this high number of weights just memorized our samples. If we have a small sample, for example, My weights, maybe they just memorize these values by putting them somewhere here in, a, in some way. It is possible and it, it happens. You have a lot of a very large neural network, but it has enough capacity to learn everything one by one, all the values, all the samples. In that way, it gets a very high accuracy on training, but on testing, it's a very low accuracy because it's just learned to, to memorize my data. And this is a big problem. And this is why we try to use what we call regularization, is to make the neural network behave in a way that is, is not just memorizing. It is able to generalize. One of the ways we could have used, for example, a smaller network, a smaller network that has less weights, for example, just this one, it has less weights. It doesn't have the capacity to memorize. It no longer has the capacity because it has uh, less uh, space where to store the weights, less variables. So in this case, doing things the, this way, maybe my neural network will do a better generalization when it is smaller. Does it make sense to you? Does it make sense? Oh, that could you please repeat? Sure. We were using a, a large neural network, a very large yeah. one. We got an accuracy on training over 99%. And on testing, a accuracy less than 10%. Maybe, I'm saying maybe, my network just memorized my data set inside of here. In some way, it took this value, put it in some in this weight. For example, it could have done it in multiple ways, but it just memorized it because my network is very large. It has a high capacity for to store the data. So it is possible for a large neural network to just memorize the data instead of learning the rules, the rules that can uh, link this with this. One way of doing, of making my network not overfitted, we can make it smaller. So it has less capacity to store the data. It, is, it will be forced, if for example, you, you don't have a lot of memory in your mind, you will be forced to learn the general rule. You will not just memorize an entire book or something. You will just learn the rule and it will do it because to learn the rule, 
you need le less space. But to memorize the entire book or the entire data, you need a lot of space. So if you constrain your neural network to a smaller size, it will be forced to get a high accuracy. It will be forced to learn the rules that link the input to the, to the output, the Y. Does it make sense for you, ML? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. This is one way of doing it, it's, although it's not used much right uh, at the moment. I will tell you why. Uh, so Mahdia, did you want to say something? No, no, it's okay. Yes. It's fine for you? Okay. Okay, yes. Um, Arada, mm -hmm. so even if the problem is not, I mean, you were saying maybe, maybe it's, it's um, just memorizing and not generalizing, right? Mm -hmm. So by just having like smaller network, um, so are we just checking this or is it the other way around? So I'm just a bit confused. I don't think I understood your question. So you you were just assuming um, that the um, the net is just it was just memorizing, right? The neural net network. It's possible, yeah, that the, my network was just memorizing, yeah. Yeah. So by making it smaller, I mean, why are we doing this? Is it? Yeah, good question. When we when we make it smaller. It has no longer the capacity to memorize. It can't memorize. There is no space. To memorize an entire data set, you need a lot of space where to put things. But if you, we don't have space to memorize a data set, the network will do to like to converge to do a good job to get a 99% accuracy. It needs to do something different instead of memorizing. So it will. So it, needs, it needs. It needs to learn. Sorry. So the learning will happen, right? It will. It needs to learn the general rule, not just yes. memorizing yeah. things. But what are the, the general rule? It is compressed rules, small rules that makes the relay like link the input data to the class. Because memorizing is just is so simple that it just store. For example, we have this row. This is the class. Why? It will just store these values and what class they are and it will just output the class because it knows everything it knows all the values and what class they are same for row number two but once a new row that comes and this row was not part of the data set then the network will uh, will not be able to to classify it because it hasn't seen it but in if it was able to learn the general rule how to understand what makes this a y class, for example, class A, what makes this row class A to understand what uh, what is inside here, what values make this A, if it can learn the, the rule, for example, multiplications, divisions, etc., and understand that this operation make this a rule, uh, make this an A, in that case, it will no longer memorize the entire row. It will memorize the operation to transform this row to an A. And an operation is smaller. It doesn't store all or everything because the operation is shared by all the rows. Does it make sense? Uh, yes. Yeah. So when we have like when we just make it smaller, like the data set, um, are we are we forcing it to not memorize and learn the rules? Yeah, we are pushing it towards that direction. We cannot control it. It's still a gradient descent. We can't control what it is doing. But we are adding a constraint. You don't have a lot of memory, so you have to find the way tell it. You have to find another way to get a good accuracy. And this other way is probably something uh, that doesn't take a lot of memory, which is generally the, the rules. Rules, one rule that links inputs to output is generally a lot smaller than the entire data set. Uh, so can we say that we are just eliminating um, memori memorizing the data, uh, like, we are, yeah. yeah, we are eliminating yeah. this possibility because we don't, we don't yeah. want to okay. give the network this possibility. Mm -hmm. so Thank the network you. Will, will do something else. It's uh, very autonomous. It's very hard to predict to, to what direction it's going to, to go. So we add, like, insert something there. Like we influence, we can influence the network from the outside world. If we make it smaller, 
we know it's probably going to go to a certain direction. If we make it bigger, it will have a lot of direction to go to. And it generally goes to the fastest direction, which is just memorizing. Memorizing is so simple for it. So we try to constrain it to some sort of uh, group of solutions and eliminating other possibilities that we don't like. Does it make sense? I know it's not an easy concept. You will have like to train a lot to uh, like absorb it uh, fully. Well, and once we go to uh, CNNs and especially the transformers, we use this concept a lot. Uh, we use this inductive bias to influence a network to go to a certain direction uh, that works best for us. And it is it is understood intuitively. It's very hard to understand it to understand it logically. You need you need to understand it like uh, intuitively. Like you influence it by like making it not able to do certain things, so it will probably do other things. Does it make sense for you, ML? Yes, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. And other you other guys, how how are you feeling about it? Yes, okay. Great. So we can also to improve things, we can get more data, add more features, reducing like the number of neurons. And there are other things that we can do with the neural network to make it better. For example, this is a simple concept. It is called early stopping. As we said in the batch uh, stochastic, like SGD, stochastic uh, gradient descent, we are using batches. Each batch is containing 32 or something. So we can stop the learning before reaching like the global minimum. For example, we have the global minimum here, or the local minimum minimum here. We can stop the learning here, because sometimes the global minimum minimizes things for the entire data set. And if we make uh, things do well for the entire data set, maybe we are over learning. We are making things only good for the data set, but not for like like the test set that uh, the network has never seen this is the training and this is the testing the loss function is for the training alone it is trained on the gradient descent is computed only on the training samples but not for the testing so this loss function we are optimizing it for the training the testing, we don't know it uh, about it. It can come even in the future. So sometimes what we do, we stop before reaching the global minimum or the local minimum. We stop here and we check with the testing. If we see with testing and training, the accuracy is similar and it is not improving if we go forward. Uh, or, or sometimes it improves when we go forward. I will show you some, some graphs like it improves when we go forward, but it gets reduced on testing. Like here. So this is a loss function. It is going down and then go up. And so, and so here with this loss function, it's better to stop here. This is the number of iterations. And this is the error computed by the loss. So the error in the beginning is uh, getting reduced, reduced, reduced. And some at some point here, it gets higher on testing but on training it keeps getting reduced on training it keeps going down so if we stop here it is better it's not very uh, we are losing things for uh, training but we care more about testing this data set my uh, network has never seen it and it is doing on it almost the same as here so it's better to stop here does it make sense for you guys Yes, yeah. So sometimes we call we do this what we call early stopping. We stop once we see that we don't improve testing anymore. We are improving training, but testing is not improving, so it's better to stop. Because this global this local minimum here for training is not really the global minimum for uh, things that are beyond the training set. The data set that we don't we, my network hasn't seen. So when we stop here, we generalize better. Please, Reza, how we can know when we can stop exactly? 
with AKC? Yeah, uh, yeah, I just uh, mentioned it. For example, you have here this for training for testing, and you have here for training. So when do you stop here? So we have here the values, the epoch. So here it's here it's ten. Here it's twenty. Here it's thirty. Here it's forty. So when do you do you stop? So this is for training. Yeah, 30 seems better. This is for testing. So we stop here. It's better because here we are not no longer improving things for uh, testing, but for training it is improving. So here we are mainly overfitting. It's not good what we are doing here. So we stop here. Is the best, is the best we can get. Yeah, with this function and yeah. well, well, the testing that we have is the best we can get. Yeah. But yeah, we have to uh, watch out for the, the leakage, etc. But, but, uh, but Reva, it's, uh, it's, it's through the accuracy. How can I fix this? Is it yeah, 30? It's, it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's the error. You compute the error on training and the error on testing. You hit the error here on training. And you take your testing data that you haven't used for, uh, tra for to train your network. And you check. And you, but, and so you I have, see that I... it is, uh, it is uh, deteriorated. So I have to uh, to calculate uh, the error every time. Yes. For you, yeah, after each uh, ten or so, you have to do, to do something like that. Yeah. And okay. We call this early stopping. Stopping before like. Uh... Okay. Okay. You might also try. You may try small learning rates. I will mention that uh, more in detail after. You can use the L two. Can you or do you remember what is L2? From uh, we did it uh, with linear regression, with logistic regression. We talked about L2. Is L2. it a lago? Mm -hmm. Is yeah. it a lago regression? I think. It's what? Sorry. Is it a lago? I think. La La sure. La Ridge and lasso. That's what we did. Yeah, lasso. Sorry. Yeah. 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 That that was it. It it just forced the networks. So this is the by loss function. What we, for example, uh, the cross entropy that minimize the error. And we add to it another term that we want to minimize as well. And this term that we want to minimize is just the norm of the weights. It means that we, we want to minimize how big the weights are. It's like this weights, w, my Ws, will be as small as possible. We try to minimize the loss function, but we try to minimize also the weights of the network. We want the weights of the network, my Ws, to be as small as possible. Like find a good solution and making them small. Generally, when you make them small, in general rules, it overfits less. Because small values, for example, they can't store entire data sets. Data sets are stored by like uh, generally my big values. So this uh, this way, my model can overfit less because we will not allow it to go, not allow the weights to go very high. We want to minimize this and this. So we minimize the loss function and the sum of the square of the weights. Multiplied here, it's a factor, a coefficient that you set, 0.6 or so, or so, something like a coefficient. Just to, to to balance things between the loss and the, the more. So this is just to force the network to, or the, the waste not to go too far, too high. Okay, guys, for for the L two, L one is the same. We have L one more. Some the uh, L two try to make everything small. L one can make things become zero. It allows some weights to go high. But it, uh, if it if it, it finds that it can allow some ways to go high and some ways to become zero, it does it. it makes things sparse. Sparse meaning that, that we will have a lot of zeros in our weights. You maybe you don't want it for your network. You don't want all the ways, many ways to become zero. Uh, or you so in some cases you prefer your ways to become zero. So L1 can make some ways become zero. L2 it tries to bring everything. Uh, to small values. 
but not necessarily zeros. That's the difference between the two. I can I gave you like a whole explanation why uh, the square etc. Last last time when we did the linear regression and logistic regression, I can't do it again, but it will take us some time like to study uh, both functions. For now, it's better to see that L2 brings everything to uh, small values. All the weights will be small of the network. L1 can make can make some weights become zero and other weights go a little bit higher. It's try to break everything down because uh, it's the absolute value of W instead of the square. But uh, it can make things also to become zero, some ways to become zero. Sometimes you don't want it for your network. Are you happy with this explanation, guys? It's a very simple explanation. I didn't want to go to the details because it takes some time. But the, this is what I want you like to memorize for L1 and L2. Are you happy, guys? Yes, okay. Okay, Maria, are you happy? I saw your you Yes. <laughs> yes. Great. We can also use what we call data augmentation. It's like we generate, we add, we make our data set bigger. We generate some semi-synthetic data, we can call it fake data, and we add it to my data set. For example, it works very well with images. For example, when we have a data set of images, we can, when you we ro rotate the image, so imagine you have a cat in an image. If you we rotate it a little bit, it's still a cat. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. If we zoom slightly, it's still a cat. Zoom slightly or zo zoom in and out. Translating, you move by a few pixels left and right. It's still a cat. So we can augment. My data set just by these simple operations. We can flip. If we flip the ear the cat, it will still again be a cat. We can add a little bit of noise, just slightly some noise, and it will still be a cat. So we can augment the data set by multiple ways. Sometimes, like we can multiply the size by 1000 by just these uh, operations. Because, for example, rotations, we can rotate by five degrees at multiple times and by that way we will have uh, a lot of images a lot of, a lot more images just based on one image zoom in out translating flipping adding noise and we can like ex make the data explode just by adding all of these uh, variants it can also be applied to speech recognition like the voice for example when you transform the voice you add noise etc you can also get the same uh, words but with different voice, different tone, uh, like different, like you can augment, add the, the length or the timing, etc. Okay, so you can use data augmentation in certain cases. For text, for example, it's more difficult to add data augment to do data augmentation with text because uh, you need a certain structure. The same structure as the original uh, data, but for images and for uh, speech, uh, for speech, for sound, it's generally very simple to do data augmentation. To mention also data augmentation, I wanted to mention this. This is a more of an advanced topic, but uh, it's good to just to know about it. We have what we call in CNNs adversarial attacks. Adversarial attacks. But in the, this image or this uh, model we take a banana and the model has predicted it as a banana with an accuracy of almost 100 uh, percent it's sure it's a banana we added only a sticker next to it which, which looks like a noise and it was recognized as a cluster <laughs> by a very high accuracy you can see how we like we fooled the model just by applying some var variations to it it's because it wasn't trained a lot on noise and uh, on uh, different things like it's like it was able like it almost like overfitted to the training data set it's not able to recognize things that uh, are modifications of what we had also for example we had another model we have a model here that recognized this as a panda with 57 percent confidence we add just a little bit of noise you can see we add this by multiplying it by 0.007 it 
it was now it's still a product with the human mind. There is almost no difference between this image and this image because this Moisey image was multiplied by this very small number. But the network recognized it as a gibbon, which is uh, some race of monkey with a 99% accuracy. I just wanted to, to show you that uh, modifying slightly the images that are not the same as the one used in the uh, training can make the model behave uh, in an expected way, in an unexpected way. Okay, guys. Now, this is what I wanted to show in regularization, the dropout. It's probably the most famous regularization technique in the network. If you remember in the part in part one, we used or we saw ensembling. You do remember ensemble methods. Do you remember ensemble methods, guys? No? You remember random no. forests? You remember yes. uh, re remember uh, random forest, ADA boost, FG boost. These models, what they did, they took multiple models and combined them. By the way, guys, this is the last point. I'm going to finish now. And I know you are too tired. But this is like the last point. So what we did was to have, like take a vote or have, like combine these models in uh, multiple ways, in some way, to combine them. This is called ensembling. And ensembling usually win ML competitions. Machine learning competitions are mostly won by ensembling. By some ensemble. For example, Google Net is a CNN model for image processing that has won some competition. And it is an ensemble of six models. But to do ensembling that way, for example, if you remember Random Forest, we needed to train multiple models and because deep learning is uh, takes a lot of time to train if we do that explicitly it will take us a lot of time yes guys yeah we need to train to train yeah to train multiple models with deep learning so we have this thing what we call dropout it's so simple and so powerful during each iteration, during training, what we did, we randomly remove certain neurons, like here. We remove this one, we remove this one, we remove this, etc. Randomly, by probability. So in each iteration, so we take a batch, uh, we remove some neurons, we do the training. And in the, not the next iteration, we do the same thing. We randomly we put them back and we randomly remove again others. So each, what is happening, guys? In each iteration, we are having a diff different network. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. In each iteration, we are having a different neural network. And it's like we are using different neural architectures but with the same weights, the weights they don't change. We update the same weights, and we are. It's almost like we're making different architectures, and we are averaging them. This is the effect. We just remove things randomly, and at the end of the day, it's like we are combining different neural networks together. Let's stop here, and we will continue on this next time. I know you are uh, too tired. Let's. Yeah, thank you.